Welcome to CNN Student News. I'm Carl Azus from Atlanta, Georgia. Yesterday we told you about a military leader's defection from North Korea to South Korea. Today we're reporting on two men who defected who left the ISIS terrorist organization. This happened in Afghanistan. It used to be ruled by an Islamic militant group called the Taliban, which allowed terrorists to live and train there. But the Taliban were kicked out of power when international forces, led by the U.S., attacked in 2001. The war never completely wiped out the Taliban, though. They're still operating in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the ISIS terrorist group has worked to recruit Taliban members. Two men who became ISIS recruits say they were offered better weapons and not much choice. But they became disillusioned with ISIS and left the group at the risk of possibly being executed, partly because they say they found some of ISIS's tactics un-Islamic, and partly because they say ISIS just likes killing and doesn't take care of its fighters' families. Looking for ISIS-FM. In Afghanistan's east, ISIS's radio broadcast of hate was bombed off air recently by the U.S. But here... It's been coming back in the past week. It was there three days ago and it's gone again, says one man. They were talking nonsense, says another. They were asking people to pledge allegiance and march on Kabul, he adds. This is one broadcast they recorded earlier. ISIS is trying to put down roots here. But every day, more Afghans want to tear them up. And that starts here with Arabistan and Zaytun. Two months ago, we wouldn't have been sat like this. Then, there were commanders in ISIS. ISIS, they say, came from Pakistan, not Iraq, and promised guns and money to their struggling group of Taliban. Their agenda? Black flags, killing and looting, which they did go along with at first. They knew who was rich to take their money. The poor, they would arm to fight for them or kill them. The two men work with Afghan intelligence, who set up our interview to get other locals to join an uprising program against ISIS. But they say they've lacked government protection and money, and that's put potential defectors off. The fight is now just left to American drones, they say. Drones are doing a good job killing ISIS. They target them as soon as they leave their houses. The government hasn't made any progress in those areas. It's only the bombing that's effective. You were in the Taliban, then you were in ISIS, and now American drones are bombing your own village, but you're pleased about it because they're killing ISIS. Is that not a strange feeling for you? It makes us happy. We want them wiped out. They're killers themselves who know what they're talking about. Arabistan holds up his cloak. Holes from an American helicopter attack not long ago when he was Taliban. ISIS has shattered ordinary lives too. Across town, in a luxury village built for rich people who never came, are hundreds of families who fled ISIS. Afghanistan, like many nations inflicted by ISIS, basically has to battle an idea, a kind of virus that appeals to minds warped after decades of war that don't see the Taliban as radical enough. An idea that no matter how hard you battle or bomb it, it's very difficult to completely extinguish. U.S. Speaker of the House Paul Ryan said yesterday that he didn't want and wouldn't accept the Republican Party's nomination for president. But the Speaker isn't one of the candidates who's been running for president. So why would he talk about the nomination? Because of a contested or open convention. It's an environment in which someone who isn't currently running, like House Speaker Ryan, could possibly win the nomination. An open convention could happen for Democrats and Republicans this year if no one candidate from either major party wins enough delegates to clinch the nomination beforehand. So the convention would become the place where the party nominee is determined. As an open convention appears more likely, especially on the Republican side, we're looking at who sets the rules for it. He who writes the rules, rules, as the old saying goes.
And I think it's going to boil down to is how strong Donald Trump and Ted Cruz are and how close they are. In order to win the nomination in Cleveland, you have to identify 1,237 supporters that are actually in the seats in Cleveland. I don't think you can say that we don't get it automatically. I think it would be, I think you'd have riots. I think you'd have riots. A lot of schools back from spring break this week and a lot of requests on yesterday's transcript page. Here are three of them. St. Clair Middle School is in St. Clair, Michigan. It's where the Saints go marching in. Smith Station High School is in Smith Station, Alabama. I think we've seen you here as well. Great to have the Panthers. And from the city of Playa del Carmen in the state of Quintana Roo, Mexico, welcome to our viewers at Colegio Inglés. The city of San Diego, California is just one part of San Diego County where 3.3 million people live. About 20% of school-aged children there live in poverty. Some have never seen the ocean despite living just miles from it. The founder of the Ocean Discovery Institute says their world can be very small. So she started a non-profit program that offers classroom activities, field trips and community projects to inspire budding scientists. City Heights is only 20 minutes from the ocean, and yet it's completely disconnected in many ways. It's a high poverty community, low graduation rates, high crime, infrequent opportunities for science or nature access. Okay, we have one microscope for you. I read an organization that empowers young people through the ocean sciences. We work with about 6,000 kids a year in the City Heights community, from pre-K through college and beyond. That one is a different species. So you actually found a whole totally different species in there. So by exposing them to ocean science, they get curious. What is there? It's moving there. Juliana, it's moving. When they're in the third grade and they come on our field trip, they see the ocean and they gasp because it's literally the first time many of them have ever seen the ocean. They took me swimming, my first swimming lesson. We went tide pooling with scientists. It felt exciting and like, I felt like I was in paradise. <laughs> What's this? Brain coral. Brain coral. Brain coral. That's a brain coral, right. We think of everything as a living laboratory. It's important that students get to actually understand the environment as a context for science exploration and discovery. These are barnacles and they attach with their heads. You can study technology, engineering, mathematics, all through studying the ocean. This is a career field that students from very diverse communities don't pursue, and our students are pursuing them at unprecedented rates. Working side by side with all the amazing scientists gave me that feeling that maybe I can make a difference in the world. I was really inspired to study marine biology in college. Hey, you guys, check out this key on Olympus. Cool. Wow. All kids need science opportunities. Our students who go through these programs, they succeed whatever path it is they take. In an era of wingsuits, drones, and hoverboards, makes sense someone would build something like this. Jetpack, meet hoverboard, meet risk. This invention by a company that makes water flyboards appears to use no water at all, opting instead for what looks like a jet turbine engine. The company says it can go 10,000 feet high and more than 90 miles per hour, and it doesn't come with a safety net. This is just a prototype. It's not for sale at this point, though we got to admit it looks pretty fly. The guy who tested it stands out. He certainly could star as the hero in the airborne identity or the villain in Turbinator. We should probably jet. I'm Carl Azus, and that wraps up today's coverage. <laughs>